<laughs> Sorry, I promised myself I would hold back on delving into sort of the many other things that you do extremely well. Um, you know, until we've gotten like sort of a decent amount of uh, gab about the novel out of the way. But this actually brings me, you know, this this these acts of memorialization uh, bring me to something which may or may not be related, which is that you are an, a gifted anthologist. Um, you have you you have uh, put out so far two major anthologies of Indian poetry. Is that right? Well, one really, but uh, right. the second one expanded it. it. Yeah, there were fifty six in the first and sixty right. in the in the second. Right. And, uh, well, yeah, and seventy two in the final version. Fabulous. Yeah. When so, I, and I love the fact that you've lived with sort of this one anthology um, over over sort of a considerable amount of time. Do you see any do you see any similarities between sort of the the internal sort of acts of remembrance that that eventually became Narcopolis and this sort of formal formalized structured um, act of community perhaps and and public memory that uh, that go into making well, an anthology. That you know, when you ask a question like that what immediately occurs to me is that book, the first version of it appeared in two thousand mm. and five. What was it called then? I, because it, it had several changes of name as well, right? Yeah, it was called When the when the, sea when the sea change, changes, it shall change. Yeah. And uh, it was really a, a kind of a offering mm. uh, to three poets who had died that year. Mm. Um, Nisim Ezekiel, Dom Marais, and Arun Kolatkar. And uh, the dedication page had six other poets who had died during, who were in the book but had died. So it, again, it became like a kind of a memorial. Mm. And... The, but the exciting thing about the anthology for me was it rediscovered uh, certain voices mm. in, in, in English poetry, Indian voices, mm. who had been forgotten uh, by everybody except poets. I'm sure KP will remember them. Uh, you know, other poets remember them, but right. readers had forgotten these names. Go, for example, mm. Gopal Honalgiri, amazing poet, published five books. Uh, self-published five books, mm. uh, died young, disappeared, forgotten, books out of print. Mm. Lawrence Bantelman, amazing poet, first published at the age of 18 mm. with Writer's Workshop, published two more books, went to camp, nothing happened, as happens with young poets. Nobody read the books, there was no response whatsoever. He didn't make a penny. He uh, migrated to Canada, got into public housing, became an alcoholic, died in his 30s. Uh, G.S. Sharat Chandra, excellent poet, taught in the U.S. for years, mm. uh, again published in India as well, but after he died, absolutely forgotten. Uh, Srinivas Rayaprol, amazing Indian poet, mm. lived in the U.S., corresponded with William Carlos Williams, uh, wrote, I think, three amazing books, again published by Writer's Workshop, lived in Andhra Pradesh, um, died, I think he was uh, in his early 60s, books went out of print, totally forgotten. Right, and this in spite of the fact that we have a prize in his name. Now we do. Now we do. Um, run by his daughter, right. Aparna Rai mm. yeah. So, so, So that sense of community did go into the making of anthologies? Oh, absolutely. In large part. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We should um, we should come back to that, but let's sort of veer back to Narcopolis again, <clears throat> and take up the question of discipline. Yeah. You were after sort of decades of working in certain forms, um, you know, sitting down to write a novel from start to finish. What was the discipline of that like? What what so what what did your day become as a working writer? You know, I'm going to quote Richard Hugo, mm. great American poet, mm. who once said, who had worked many, many jobs, mm. and horrifying jobs, you know, as one does. Mm. Um, you know, and, and, and I've worked more horrifying jobs than he's worked. You know. uh, he said, and I'm sure he said this as a way of consoling himself. Mm. He said, I only ever worked hard on a poem. So I have to say that I only ever really worked hard on poetry and fiction. Mm. You know, uh, all the other stuff I really 
did as little as I could, uh, just to not get fired in a hurry. What was the other stuff? You already told us about your dark days as an editor and a sub-editor. Yeah, and a reporter and a... Uh, uh, Thuggish. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A commentator and a... Uh, oh, on what? Uh, at the arts, usually. Oh, I see. Really. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, uh, the highlight mm. was a job in New York for a Where magazine. Where did you live then? Uh, uh, between 1998 and 2004. Okay. I went there to do an MFA in poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got the MFA in poetry from one of the nicest colleges in the U.S. <coughs> called Sarah Lawrence College. Mm. And with that very expensive degree, I ended up working for possibly the crappiest newspaper in the United States. Um, <laughs> it should remain nameless, but then again, no, why? Come on. India abroad. <laughs> um, and this was, let me describe this newspaper. Newspaper full of matrimonial ads and lawyer's ads, right? <laughs> India abroad, obviously. And in between the matrimonial ads and the lawyer's ads, there was some white space that needed to be filled. Right. And that's where people like me and other fools like me came into the picture. Right. So we filled it up. Just prop up the classifieds. Just kind of fill up that <laughs> very pesky white space. <coughs> so if a 10-year-old Indian kid won a spelling bee in Oregon, <laughs> I would be told at 10 a.m., 1,000 words by 5 o'clock tonight on that kid. So then I'd be on the phone talking to the kid, to his parents, to his teachers, to his friends. And, and my problem was I was always a really bad journalist because, you know, I come from a family of journalists. You give them a story at 10 a.m., my sister, for instance, before the deadline, mm. she will have filed the story. Right. Me, the next morning... I will have been there all night, you know, torturing myself about really things that you should really never think about because, <laughs> you know, nobody's really yeah. going to read it very carefully. <laughs> but I suppose it was a kind of neurosis, and I did that job for uh, four and a half years. Mm. <laughs> kept body, in a straight way, kept body and soul together. Well, or what soul you had. <laughs> really, sort of. just the body, I think. <laughs> well, I suppose that, that, that's important too. Um, no, but um, so to, to chase down this idea of discipline a little further, since you know this conversation is about, in some sense, of the nitty gritties of writing. How did you, you know? How did your working day change uh, when you were working on Narcopolis versus when you were, you know, versus your work as a poet or a musician? Uh, well, as a when you work as a poet it, mm. and as a musician, actually, mm. it's it's a lot of fun because. You know, it's your, your enthusiasm drives you. Mm. As a musician, you're working with other people. You know, it's, it's not lonely at all. And you have fun. It's a joyful kind of expression, mm. uh, artistic expression. So is poetry. Very joyful artistic expression. And you don't feel like you're working, even if you're sitting on a poem, and even if you do 50 drafts of a poem, it doesn't feel like work. Mm. With fiction, especially long-form fiction, it's a whole other story. Mm. It is very clearly work. Mm. Because you're there from 9 to 5, <coughs> and in fact, from 5 to 9 as well. Mm. And you keep working at it, and then you, you know, rework it, and then you, it never ends, really. Mm. You know? And I thought I'd worked for bad bosses in my time. I thought I'd worked for some insane bosses in my time until I started to work for myself. For yeah, and, you know, I beat all those insane bosses because no amount of work really satisfied this boss. You know. Right. Yeah. The, no the novel is a hard taskmaster. It really is. Did you, um, are you one of those novelists who can read other writers while you're working on your own stuff? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Mm. I, I like to read poetry. Um, before I, uh, some days I go straight to work, but sometimes I like to read poems mm. before I start working. Opens up the, it the windows of the mind. It really does. Mind. Yeah, and, um, you know, I'm always reading uh, poetry, and I, I read thrillers as well, mm. pretty much on a daily basis. Ah, what are you reading now? Uh, actually, right now I'm reading Kathy Acker, okay. which is kind of in between thriller and... Um, experimental American fiction, mm. and uh, I'm I'm doing an ongoing kind of uh, 
research into Harry Hola, who's who comes from a long line of uh, detectives, of alcoholic detectives. Oh. And I think he might be the best of the lot, uh, by a, a Norwegian writer called Jo Nesbo. Oh, I see. I'm trying to think of other sort of alcoholic detectives uh, here and now. Dave but I Robichaud? Suppose, right. Yeah. I mean, I suppose the it goes all the way back to Sherlock Holmes himself, who had the history of an addict, if not an alcoholic. Yeah. Right? He did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sorry, I just, you know, again, when Narcopolis came out, and because, because as much, you know, as much as, I mean, uh, sort of drugs are a character in the novel, and, you know, they're um, integral to, to the novel, a lot of people wanted to see it in the tradition of, you know, Burroughs, or sort of other writers who've, who've written about addiction, in, you know, having lived in close, uh, at close quarters with, with, addicts or with addiction themselves. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, there's clearly a body of sort of, if you want to call it, you know, narcotic literature. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, I mean, do you feel like a sort of kinship with, uh, with a lot of the, mod like with a lot of the 20th century writing that deals with this stuff? It seems to me to be so culture specific. Yeah. I mean, I know that when I was reading Narcopolis, like 1960s California was the furthest thing from my mind. Yeah, no, definitely. I, from mine as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, if I had any kind of uh, literary models during the writing of Narcopolis, it would have been the Russian writers. Mm. Um, certainly Dostoevsky's insanity in terms of structure mm. gave me tremendous courage. You know, I thought if you can do that, yeah. uh, 20 page digression on God in the middle of nowhere, mm. uh, you can do pretty much anything in, in a novel. <laughs> Oh gosh, I know. And novel writing takes a kind of, I imagine, I, you know, having never written a novel, I imagine it takes a kind of, I mean, it, it is a bloody brave thing to do, to sit there and live with yourself from nine to five and five to nine. You know, in a, and I, I mean, I, I don't know how, the, so was it a question of kind of building up the sort of the emotional muscle to do Narcopolis before you could actually sit down and finish it? Did you ever think of it in those terms? or No. I, I think, think if, if there's any muscle that you develop, mm -hmm. it's the writing muscle. Mm -hmm. And everything goes into that. Right. E everything that you've ever done goes into that. Right. You know, so I don't think you really need any qualification to write a novel other than to have been a reader. Right. I'm wondering about this, especially because Narcopolis has the distinction of being, you know, one of... We, we see very few novels that are so adept at telling a certain kind of truth. I think, you know, I mean, and fiction is about sort of facing up to certain kinds of truth, isn't it? True, true lies. True lies. Um, true lies, that, that might work. So I think, I think living with the truth takes a certain kind of strength. Which is why, um, obviously, this varies from novelist to novelist and novel to novel. But I think one of the things I admire most about Narcopolis is that it's, it's unflinching uh, until the very end. Um, it flinches at the end? And uh, <laughs> to, be, to be honest, I left the last ten pages unread. Okay. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, okay, let's jump, to, um, let's jump to talking a little bit about, about poetry. Sure. And you know the disciplines of poetry and the start of of your career uh, writing poetry, which may have been when you started to read poetry, right? Yes, it was. Yeah. Um, and uh, in fact, it had everything to do with Baudelaire, mm. uh, which seems appropriate here. Yeah. yeah. For th for this gathering yeah. over here. Uh, I was fourteen, and I had an uncle who was, for some reason, absolutely obsessed by Baudelaire. And he lived in Cochin. Mm. With the film in, in particular? I oh. With everything Baudelaire oh. had ever written. Oh, okay. Including his art criticism. And he had a library uh, of books by Baudelaire in French and in English, mm. and books about Baudelaire, criti literary criticism about <laughs> Baudelaire, and portraits of Baudelaire at different stages <coughs> of his life. Um, uh, he had a bidet in his bathroom. 
in Kerala. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was an absolute Francophile. Uh, but more than that, he was obsessed by Baudelaire. Mm. And it was an unhealthy obsession. Unhealthy because I, I went, we would go to visit Kerala every couple of years. And, at, and he always said I was his favorite nephew. I'm sure he said that to all his nephews. But uh, he used, we used to go on walks. And uh, I was 14 when he introduced me to Baudelaire. Mm. And really, if you're a good an uncle, you would not introduce an impressionable, an impressionable boy of 14 boy. to yeah. Baudelaire. So I think <laughs> I, I just kind of uh, soaked up his obsession. Mm. And I remember picking up this book that he had, uh, Translation of Fleur de Mal by two American poets, Edna St. Vincent Millay and George Dillon. And I remember the first poem was a translation of a poem called Lilette. Mm. And I read it and I remember getting, my hair stood on end. I got goosebumps. And I remember many years reading a description by uh, Emily Dickinson about when you know you have read poetry. Mm. When the top of your head flies off. What she meant was you have a physical reaction to it. And that's exactly what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And then I, I translated uh, uh, Baudelaire into English. I translated two poems into English that year mm. and uh, taught myself French. I studied French for the next, uh, I think, seven years uh, to be able to read a little bit of Baudelaire in the French. Mm. And I think that's really what did it. And, uh, you know, there's some experiences that kind of, that where an other voice can shock you into your own voice. Mm. I think that's what happened with me. How have you, have you have you sort of tried to break that down? How does that happen when a voice shocks you into <coughs> into your own? You you start writing in response to that. You do, yeah. and in imitation of. Is that what happened? With of you? course, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, and I'm glad all those poems have been destroyed. <laughs> uh, but yeah, certainly the the first few poems I wrote were in imitation of Baudelaire. Uh, all I can say in my defense is, if you're going to imitate somebody, he's not a bad one. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, we could have, uh, it could have been uh, so much less. Uh, it could have been Rod McEwen. <laughs> Wait, I don't know who that is. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> um, and has Baudelaire stayed with you all these years? Yes, he has. Yeah. I... Uh, I'm still very happy to pick up random books of criticism. Mm. Uh, just picked up something by Roberto Colasso. Uh -huh. uh, fabulous book. Kind of a weird uh, view of life through the work and life and poems of Baudelaire. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. What happened to your uncle's Baudelaire library? When he died, they sent me a big part. His, he has four daughters. Uh -huh. And one, he was actually, uh, why, when he died, he was in the middle of translating Baudelaire into Malayalam. Oh. I mean, talk I'm, about... I'm amazed no one has done that before, actually. Actually. Right. But you know, it's uh, impossible for one person to translate Fleur du Mal into any language. You need at least two or three or four people. It's too big a work. Mm. Uh, so I think it was halfway through it when he died. Mm. And they did publish some of that in Malayalam. Okay. His, his eldest daughter published some of that. And she sent me many of the books, including the one I uh, mentioned, the mm. first one that I read. Mm. Oh, I see. How fantastic that you have that legacy still. Mm. You, you've written uh, in response to Baudelaire, um, and you've written a poem addressed to him. Yes. When did you do that? That was in, did that, that, did that come out in your latest collection? It was in the last one. It was in the last one, yes. wasn't it? Yes. Perhaps we should, perhaps we should read it. Sure. Uh, in fact, there are copies outside, but I'm, I, I, I hope I remember it. Okay. This is set in Mexico, uh, where I've never been. Mm. Uh, I think it's, uh, I, I've read a bit about Mexico. I think it's a good idea to set pieces of writing either in places you've never been to, or in places you know really well. But if you visit a place for a couple of days and write about it, uh, not always a great idea. Right. You often have the wrong impression. impression. Uh, also, this poem, um, you know, 
young poets, when they start to write poetry, they think about the idea of the poet, the romantic idea of the poet, mm -hmm. as uh, somebody who burns the candle of life at both ends, who drinks too much, who does way too many drugs, who falls in love with the wrong people, and who basically destroys himself or herself uh, in a very romantic way. You know. And the problem with living that kind of romantic ideal to the end is uh, you get very little work done. You don't do much writing. You do a lot of living and you die young and it's, you leave a good-looking corpse, but you really don't leave a body of work. You know. Well, let's not underestimate a good-looking corpse. <laughs> you know. So, uh, and I, you know, I certainly subscribe to that theory of the romantic poet, as did many of my friends, and I, I uh, certainly hold Baudelaire responsible for many wasted years of my own life. And uh, finally, when I cleaned up my act, I wrote a poem uh, to Baudelaire, a kind of a poem of love and hate. To Baudelaire. I am over you at last in Mexico City in a white space high above the street, my hands steady, the walls unmoving. It's warm here and safe and even in winter the rain is benign. Some mornings I let the sounds of the plaza, a fruit seller, a boy acrobat, a woman selling impossible fictions pile up in a corner of the room. I'm not saying I'm happy, but I am healthy, and my money is my own. Some mornings, when I'm walking in the market past the chickens and the pig smoke, I think of you, your big hair and wolf's heart, your Bonaparte hair and eyes of cold. I don't miss you. I don't miss you when I open a window and light fills the room like water pouring into a paper cup, or when I see a woman's white dress shine like new coins, and I know I could follow my feet to the river and let my life go away from me. At times like this, if I catch myself talking to you, I am always surprised at the words I hear of regret and dumb boyish devotion. Thank you. I only messed up with one phrase. I didn't notice. Thank you. That that was that was fantastic. Um, and also, um, it, it also brings me back again to the question of discipline, which I think we've sort of touched on a couple of times before, um, which is that being a, you know, being a good poet, even the most romantic of poets, especially the most romantic of poets, takes, I think, a certain sort of iron discipline, you know, in, the, in, in, ha in having to force your truths into, into a form. Um, and I think I, th I think you've done that sort of remarkably. There's there's such a lyric quality to your poetry, um, and there's and I think that is that is sort of one of the aspects of it that I would count as romantic with a capital R. Um, shall we talk a little bit about sort of you know some other poets of whom this has been said? Yeah. Um, I. I can't help but draw the comparison to Don Moraes. Sure. Also sort of, you know, considered as one of sort of the most important new romantics of the 20th century. Absolutely. Um, and perhaps we should, you know, in, talk, in talking in classroom words like discipline and form, it might be good to start talking also about teachers and, and you know, com and uh, confreres and companions. Um, I, I would say my first and best teacher was Don Moraes. Mm. Because I met him in my 20s, I was 26 when I first saw him read, and we became friends when I was 27. Mm. And for the next... Um, this was in Bombay. This is in Bombay. Right. When he was living on Alana Mark mm. in Sargent House, uh, a wife, uh, house owned by his wife, right. Leela Naidu. And uh, over the next 10 years, mm -hmm. they really were my family in Bombay. Um, you know, any time... I needed a meal, for instance. I knew I could always have 